Hello, welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me are... Aaron. And Gabe. And we'll go into Gabe, who Gabe is in just a second, but first, Aaron, what are you drinking tonight? I actually have a crawler of Industry Brewing's uh, pulling a double, which is a double IPA. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. It's really good. It I'm, is. I'm usually not a big IPA fan, but well, I'm coming around to them. You got to wreck your palate first and then, <laughs> then you like them. That's what my friends always told me. And then I started liking them after a while. Mm hmm. Gabe? Uh, I've got orange juice and some black tea right now. It is early in the morning for me. And then I am uh, still working on some new Glarus Serendipity, their uh, Harvest Happy Accident Fruit Ale. So, so as you noticed, Gabe said that it's morning for him. It's the middle of the night for me and Aaron. Gabe, who are you? Why are you here? And what have you done with Chris? <laughs> what have I done with Chris? <laughs> Uh, I work for E3D, uh, so I am in Oxford in the UK, um, and uh, for them I work for, as a subdivision I guess, well technically separate company, um, I work for Pathio, um, which when this podcast goes live will have launched uh, earlier in the week, um, the new slicer that we're putting out. Well that's super cool. Yeah. But Gabe, you don't sound like a Brit. I don't sound like a Brit. I am actually from good old Massachusetts. Um, I got flown over here because we don't have a Boston office. Um, just waiting for that to happen anytime now. I've been telling Sanjay he needs an America's based office in central Illinois for like three <laughs> years now. He just won't listen. Yeah. I mean, we can split the distance and. Uh... <laughs> no, no, we'll end up in like Ohio or Pennsylvania then. And neither of those are good options. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know other slicers are based in Ohio. They make it work. So you just need the international office that's based on like a barge. Ah, yes. Yeah. That sails in international waters. Yeah. Then we then can we... do poker games <laughs> and cat fights. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So how did you end up uh working for E3D game? Funny story. Um so me being lovely uh college student that I was um 2 years ago, one year ago, two summers ago. Um I was looking for something to do over the summer. Um I had actually already interned at uh Simplify 3D once in my freshman summer and then had spent some time uh at well, I spent a lot of time at my university, at Brandeis University's uh, Maker Lab, and was looking for something to do, ideally related to 3D printing, because I had been loving it a lot. And my parents were like, you got to figure out what to do. And I was like, yeah, I know. And they said, where, if you could intern anywhere, where would you like to intern? And I said, oh, you know, E3D or uh, Prusa Research would be really cool, but I don't, I don't speak the language for Prusa Research. Uh, so maybe E3D would be fun. And they said, how about you email them? I said, mom, it would be crazy for me to go to England over the summer. Um, and my mom was like, no, you should, you should still email them and see, see what happens. And so I said, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And then months went by because of course I didn't email them. Yeah. Eventually I did, um, uh, emailed Josh. It's really funny because at least on the old website before we launched a new one, um, a while ago, there was a jobs page that said we were looking for a um, sysadmin or something like that. So when I wrote to Josh, I said, hey, Josh, you know, I'm a guy from from the States and I'd really like to intern. Um, I don't think I could do the sysadmin position, uh, but, you know, we, I can do some things. Anyway, um, long story short, interviewed with them. They're like, yeah, you want to come over? I said, cool. I don't know what, how to get a visa. And they said, we don't know either. <laughs> um, and we fig we worked through that, figured that out. So I interned for a summer, and uh, that was really great. So I renovated the documentation for building a V6 and all that. Um, had to come back, finish my uh, last year of university, which is what we call it here, uni, and uh, and then said, "Hey, can I come back?" And they said, "Yes, please." 
and then had to figure out the real visa process of coming as a work visa instead of an intern visa. That took all of the summer after I graduated, and now I'm here. Awesome. Very nice. So you said you spent a lot of time in your college's maker lab. Have you found a new maker space to call home in Oxford? I have not yet. There is, I remember there being one that was just starting up when I was leaving as an intern. Um, I'm still figuring out, uh, I had to find it again and see if it's still up and running and all that. And the biggest problem is that I don't have a car here. Um, fortunately, Oxford has pretty good public transportation to most places, but if you're trying to get outside of Oxford, it can be a little bit dicey. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a little alcove in the, the room that I'm renting, and I really wanted to put a CNC or a cheap little laser cutter or something. But unfortunately, like it's far away from the window, so a laser cutter is probably not great. CNC yeah. is kind of noisy. I think my housemates would get mad. So I'm still figuring out exactly how to do something that's not too messy, not too noisy. Um, it's probably going to end up being more digital, like photography or something like that. But keeping the making alive. Yeah, still good. Doing my best. I mean, <laughs> I am allowed to use the workshop at E3D for anything I want. Um, but again, without a car, it's kind of hard to get because I just carpool to work. It's a little bit hard to um, get there and back and like stay late. Yeah. Um, fortunately, we do have a little bit of time set aside for kind of personal projects uh, once a week. So the engineers oh, nice. are frequently up to fun stuff and I can kind of sit in with them. Nice. Um, That's awesome. Which is really great. Tell, tell Josh that he just needs to give you a couch to sleep on so you can stay <laughs> late and do projects. It'll only benefit them. Yeah, like, yeah. In the end, you'll only end up working late. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, that's um at the moment my my project repertoire is a little low. I'm still working on getting settled. <laughs> what did you work on um before you got your internship when you were doing the Maker Lab stuff in college and like and before that what got you what what kept your interest? So I was mostly so the, our Maker Lab at Brandeis basically does its best to serve any part of the campus that could use the help. So working with the science departments, obviously, but also the, the arts departments, you know, sculpture classes would come in and do 3D scanning and 3D printing. Um, we had some interest for about doing VR projects um, from the psych classes and things like that. And Fortunately, I didn't have to deal with all of the um, different departments because I, rather than being part of the Maker Lab, I had a 3D printing club that I helped run. And so basically what I did there was just kind of helping people to learn 3D printing and modeling and then fixing our ever-growing list of printer problems. Because um, we basically just bought a lot of printers and we decided we wanted to buy a lot of different printers, which was all well and good until they started breaking and then yeah. they were all different. So yeah, running the club and um, and repairing and, and learning to, to print well was a lot of fun. Basically, most of what we did, we didn't have the more traditional, you know, engineering stuff because Brandeis doesn't have an engineering school. So we didn't have access to a machine shop and things like that. So 3D printing and light robotics were basically as dirty as we could get because we were based in the library. Okay. What were you going to school for? Um, I was originally going to school for computer science, um, then took on a minor in education. So I'm one clerical error away from being certified to teach. Still need to oh, fix nice. that, actually. Uh, we, I wanted to do more engineering stuff, but again, we don't have an engineering school. So YouTube adversity will take care of you. I yeah, constantly sure. tell people I learned to be an engineer on the Internet. Not entirely true, but it's mostly true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, is it Haas's tutorials on which drill bits to select and things like that get me very fired up. I'm like, ah, oh, how does anyone remember all of this? I just have to bookmark this and come back to it later. Yeah, n nobody remembers all of it. Everybody <laughs> looks it up later. It's fine. <laughs> do you have any questions for him, Aaron? What kind of stuff do you like to work on for, uh, for personal projects? Uh, I started off originally by... Um, it was very fortuitous, actually. So I, I play a lot of video games. Um, I play Dota 2. Dota 2 actually lets you export the 3D models because they have a community that uh, basically makes cosmetics for the game. And then if you make nice ones, you can sell them in game. Um, but that means that you have to be able to get the base models of the character so that you can make the cosmetics. So they let you export all of that 
And I was lucky enough to be able to do that and export it with armatures too. So it could go into Blender, it could pose them and then clean them up and print them. And it was, nice. um, oh, that's I said, cool. ex extremely fortuitous. Um, so that was kind of where I started late. I mean, that was four years ago. Later on, it's been mostly helping out other people. Lately, I got into mechanical keyboards and have built a couple. Um, oh, nice. Neat. Which is really fun. Although they always end up being a little bit like jankier and messier than I would like. Are you doing keycaps or are you like actually building the keycaps are keyboards? hard. Um, building the actual keyboard is much easier. So um, we've been doing that. The f the very first one we created was called the 4AM because um, we put on 24-hour 3D printathon uh, every year when I was in school. And um, at 4 o'clock in the morning, we decided on the layout of what it was supposed to look like. So we decided to build a split keyboard um, nice. that had to talk over a TRRS cable uh, headphone jack. And okay. that was a mistake. Um, it turns <laughs> out uh, that was... While not technically difficult, it made the firmware situation. There's really lovely open source firmware called uh, QMK. Um, yeah. But it's not really set up for split keyboards. There's two examples that we could find. Because um, we were also not using a Teensy, which is what most people use for a keyboard. We were using a Pro Micro. Um, anyway, long story short, I uh, ended up getting some help from one of the original creators of an existing QMK keyboard. And got it mostly working. So that was a hard one. The next one I did was much simpler. I have a friend who um, just graduated and is now working at Form Labs. So we were able to make like a Form Labs themed keyboard. It's all orange. Oh, nice. Their workshop. But that was much simpler. That was not split. <laughs> we just get the microcontroller, put it in, solder the wires to it, and it works out of the box. Uh, <laughs> at least that was the hope. And then we complicated it by attempting to make keycaps and things like that, which <laughs> didn't go so well. And then I moved to the UK, so that was great. Yeah, it makes it harder to help your friends. I've been make, I've been looking to make a split uh, mechanical keyboard. I know uh, the Iris is a popular design, which uh, yeah. And and I so I saw the creator was working on an Iris version two, which will be USB C based and have like a lot of other upgrades over the first version so i've been waiting for that to come out to that's awesome get started um yeah i mean splits are great as long as you're not hand wiring because that's what we were doing it was just tricky because we didn't know the firmware that well so i've i mean i've done programming but we obviously never learned to do low level stuff so i was dealing with literally you know transport transporting across the trs cable so reading uh bits from the other side and things like that so we had too many rows. We were going over eight bits, and it was like I don't know what to do now. Like <laughs> I can't flip any more bits from zeros to ones. Nice, that's super cool. That is super cool. Do you have anything else before we dive into what is Pathio and why is Pathio? Nope. <laughs> okay. So the meat and potatoes. So, so what is Pathio and why is Pathio? And <laughs> The Pathio is a new slicer. Um, if you've seen the video I did the voiceover for, so we built it from the ground up. Um, it's not built based off of existing slicer, you know, tech stacks. Basically, we wanted to start with modern technology uh, or modern programming languages and things like that and really give it our best shot to almost like start over because slicers are kind of old at this point. And they're obviously chugging along, but what, what do you mean? Of age. I I have a new version of Kira right here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you've seen the development cycle of Slice 3R, sorry, I meant ah. Slicer. <laughs> slicer, Slick 3R, whichever way it's, it's uh, pronounced. I mean, you've seen that uh, Proust's team has been arguing about, or not arguing, sorry, they've, I feel like they've been fighting with the, with the existing program to kind of give it a better ui which they're doing an amazing job on um, yeah they are. the latest betas uh, but it meant that they're spending a lot of of their dev time kind of rewriting it um, yeah so we we decided let's start from from scratch basically so when you say you're starting from scratch why we in in comparison to other slicers give us a, a little bit of background on on why Sure. So one of the other things we wanted to do was basically create, um, just think a little bit more about the slicing process in terms of 3D-ness instead of 2D-ness. Obviously, mm -hmm. slicers take a 3D model, 
and then uh, most slicers will just kind of cut that at effectively z heights um, if you imagine take a cross section fill in perimeters uh, find the spots that are supposed to be infill add some infill do what anything else that you've asked them to do uh, you know all the settings and things like that and then combine all of that into actual G code. Pathio is attempting to do a little bit more in the 3D space rather than immediately going to cross-sectioning in 2D. We basically, I mean, the big thing that we're talking about is uh, 3D offsetting, which is the very first thing we do after getting a mesh and starting to slice is that we'll generate a, a full 3D shell of your part, if you imagine, like scaling your part in a little bit and then taking the region that's the difference between the larger part of uh, version of your model and the smaller one that whole region in all the way around in 3D space is, uh, becomes your shell rather than just kind of uh, manually offsetting on each cross section. And, and that lets us basically give us a little bit more isotropy for mechanical properties mm -hmm. um, to try and keep the shell the same everywhere, no matter how you orient it. And is something that's not really possible if you immediately go to cross sectioning. Okay. What else does that do for you? Which part? The 3D offsetting. I, I'm trying to think of various ways that that can benefit you in slicing and uh, different types of models. Well, one thing that we're looking f to do, it's not quite in the initial release, is um, because we have a little bit more going on at the 3D level, we can do some more smarter understanding of what's going to happen uh, later on in your model. So, for example, we can see on the future layers and on previous layers if you're going to have uh, overhangs, or if you're going to start to have the top surfaces of your model, um, if you imagine like a, a cube, you're going to see that the top is going to be coming basically mm -hmm. at a previous layer. We already currently start to do some things where you're starting to get to a top surface and you'll um, create what we're calling shelving, um, which kind of improves the top surfaces and the way that they're tracked, um, the way the perimeters uh, interact with the top shell. Uh, future in the future, we're hoping to do a little bit more with you know seeing that overhangs are coming and and creating ways to deal with that and whatever makes sense for your particular model. Um, if we can you know lower the layer heights in particular regions, kind of like adaptive um, layering from other slicers um, or something more complicated that has yet to uh, kind of really take shape, that gives us a little bit more flexibility there, I guess. Yeah, I. I was slicing a model tonight, actually, that I feel like could utilize that for full clarity. Uh, Aaron and I have been in the closed beta for Pathio for about six, seven months now. And so we've seen the, the nitty gritty and we've been playing with uh, the 3D offsetting and uh, some of the other features that Gabe's been talking about for a few months now. And we finally get to talk about it. <laughs> um but tonight I was slicing some models for uh, I, I forget what they're actually called, but they're uh, solids of constant width. So they're uh, like a, a 3D solid. Uh, but if you put three of them together and you roll them around, they roll like balls instead of really uh, cool. being super lumpy. And so they're fairly organically shaped. And uh, I was playing with slicing them through Pathio so that uh, I could utilize the 3D offsetting and not have to use infill in them because I'm printing a ton of them to give to kids tomorrow. Maybe. Um, <laughs> like, they are also not flat anywhere, so uh, I'm getting a lot of failed prints. <laughs> it's not going well. I have like, I have like 15. It's good enough for a demonstration. <laughs> But uh, the 3D offsetting is, has been kind of neat for that so that I can print these all the way around and not have to use infill. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about it is that we're hoping that it gives us better part strength in general. And so um, I know a lot, I, I especially originally thought, do we really need you know consistent thickness all the way around? Because usually you have, say, three perimeters and two top and bottom surfaces, maybe three or four, depending on your printer. And um, obviously the math doesn't, it, it doesn't work on that. You don't have a solid shell. And when you do, you end up with a lot more top and bottom surfaces, which sometimes people are like, this seems kind of strange. But if you imagine you're looking for a, uh, a real mechanical part, we find that that's actually really beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. Perimeters are always your strength, not your infill. I think it makes perfect sense. So what else does Pathio bring? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
I mean, hopefully the marketing blitz uh, has, has hit by the time the video is up or this audio is up. Um, I think my most exciting thing in Patheo is probably the grouping features. As I said earlier, I have an uh, intern for Simplify 3D. I really like Simplify 3D, but the process system in Simplify kind of, um, it, it bothers me. Um, it works really well, but from a user experience and, and, and training perspective, because I do documentation, it's really confusing because it does a lot of things like you use it for the same model and do different you know settings at different C heights and you also use it for multi-material and you also use it for different groups on your build plate and it it's a kind of a weird abstraction if you think about it um, yes i know other slicers have a little bit more elegant ways of dealing with it like bruce's slicer lets you set individual settings per model but it's kind of messy to get there i actually don't even know how to do it in kira i'm sure you can though you so can. yeah yeah i always keep looking for it and i always miss it it's a uh... It's in a weird spot. It's like down on the left hand side of it. If you click a model, there's a thing that says per model settings. And honestly, I've mm. never used it. <laughs> I, I use Kira a lot and I've never used it. Huh. So anyway, in Patheo, we um, this was actually before I even joined the project. This was part of the slicer was that we created a grouping system that makes, I think, a lot more sense than the other abstractions and the other workflows. Basically, you put models into groups, and then you can set slicing settings either for the whole project per particular group or per particular model. And what I like a lot about that is it gives you a lot of freedom to set up your workspace how you want. Imagine if you're doing a dual extrusion model, you could put the two different models uh, in different groups, or you put them in one group and set the per model settings differently. I think it just really brings the different workflow processes like into one place that makes a lot of sense and we're still figuring out the best ways to enable people to use all of those like for example right now we have a little bit of trouble with aligning models for dual extrusion but that's because we were originally thinking that people would always put them in the same group and then mm. folks like you guys showed us no sometimes people want to put them in two groups and then that <laughs> can get a little bit dicey and things like that um welcome to user acceptance testing Right. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, it's totally valid, right? We we give you the options to do that. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so it just means changing the algorithm because like, for example, right now, um, rafts and other additions are created per group. So if you put two models that are in different groups next to each other, you'll get rafts that basically overlap. Um, okay. Because we didn't expect that. <laughs> So we're, we, we have some work to do. But for a lot of cases, it's a really cool way of quickly setting up exactly what you want to do for more complicated prints. Yeah, I think, um, I think the way you guys ran the beta was really smart with like getting a small amount of people that are pretty good at printing and then opening that up to a large amount of people that are re reasonably good at printing and like <laughs> seeing all of the various and sundry ways they break your workflow that yeah. you guys think is the workflow and then opening it up to the world, brave, brave souls um, <laughs> to see all the various and sundry ways that the world's now going to break your workflow. Um, For sure. And you guys have taken the feedback really well. I'm happy to hear that because that's mostly my job right now is making sure that the feedback that you guys give us gets translated into real priorities. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly would you say you do here, Gabe? <laughs> yeah it's a little bit all over the place especially with launch week being just behind us um so my my job <laughs> title originally was i was going to be doing documentation which i have done um very happy to say that uh we have i think among the best documentation of slicers especially coming out of the gate that's all thanks to a really really lovely open source project called antora which uh, lets you create the static websites based off of ASCII doc, which is basically just fancier markdown. It's a super awesome project. I'm hoping we can contribute some more to the development of that. Um, I did my first merge request uh, earlier last week. It was very exciting. It's one Congratulations. I'm very happy. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, check it out if you're interested in documentation. So I, that was my first bit. And then I also kind of became in charge of running the experience for the beta testers so making sure everyone got onboarded and then taking people's feedback i have this huge table um really awesome also a uh, website called Airtable, which is basically excel but everything you wish excel was 
and it has about 500 or so of your guys' suggestions right now, some of which are closed, but many of which are still open, that you, I've you know basically put together from everything everyone said. We're still figuring out if we want to keep using that, because now we're going to have, instead of 100 beta testers, probably maybe 10 times of that, if we're lucky. Um, oh. Probably a lot more than that, even. <laughs> um, so we're still figuring out the best ways to do all of that. So, but from now on, I'm going to be doing a little bit more of reading uh, what's on the our forum, uh, making sure that people are happy, helping fix people's uh, issues and, and slice errors. And that all kind of goes hand in hand, right? If people are getting bugs with the software, then that's you know part of our priorities. Right. So would you take say that you take the information from the users and you hand it to the engineers so the engineers never have to talk to the users? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm kind of like that firewall so that the, um, we do like to have the, I mean, the engineers like to talk to the users. Um, Gabe, have you seen the movie Office Space? I have, I have a long time ago. Okay. (laughs) It's been too long. You should watch it. It has been too long. (laughs) All I remember is the, the hitting the printer, which is how I feel whenever someone asks me to fix a 2D printer because... (laughs) <laughs> I don't understand how 2D printers work, but I'm fine with 3D printers. Uh, it is a very, very different world. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it's been great because every time we have like a real issue, usually the response has either been like, ah, we actually fixed that at, at like seven o'clock this morning and that's coming out <laughs> tomorrow or, <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. And then, you know, then it turns into a 30 minute conversation with the person that's working on that part of the project. And then yeah. you know, a couple of weeks later, you see your ideas implemented and it's like, oh, wow, I did things. <laughs> I <Yeah>. helped. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the efficacy of our users is something that if I do my job right, should be an interesting um, selling point for for Pathio, I guess, because other slicers, even even the open source ones, I feel like could be a little bit opaque and like what they're working on and, and where people's suggestions go um yeah and certainly for for closed source ones and so hoping to make the the roadmap and the the process of what we work on be the most useful things for everybody else i shouldn't dig my whole that hole too far because if i do a bad job then people are like you said on makers on tap that i was gonna <laughs> get the features that i wanted it's so. okay there's only like 35 people that listen to the show so <laughs> it's fine <laughs> So. No, but like when you when you said uh, closed and open source projects that they take your feedback, I I have yet to have anyone from the Pathio project just blatantly say like, no, no, you're wrong, <laughs> and uh, you do it this way. So that's been a refreshing change. <laughs> well, I mean, we're still we're still so much. Everything is so much up in the air. Yeah, and the nice thing about the app is that we have a separation between what you see, which is the JavaScript front end, and the back end, which is C++. Um, and basically, that lets us freely change up the UI without having to really mess with the more complicated algorithms in the back end, um, which is really nice, because it means that people are saying, oh, you know, the, the printer uh, configuration screen is, doesn't make sense to me. We can, you know, we can work that or change that, work that around, change the fields that are available to, for people to work with. Um, and the backend guys can continue to work on uh, what, they're, what they're doing um, without being bothered about what the screens look like, basically. So when you say backend, is, is any of this cloud-based or is it all just run on my local machine? No, it's all on your local machine. Um, we had thought we might want to do a cloud-based solution. This was before I joined the project. And then decided that would just kind of be a mess, um, especially like trying to upload people's models without, you know, worrying about copyright issues. And then also sometimes models are really big and slicing takes a long time. It's just like, oh, it's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is a native app, works on uh, all three operating systems, all three major ones, I should say. There's, pro- there's more Linux distros than I can shake a whatever <laughs> you're supposed to shake a thing at. Um, you can shake a penguin at. A penguin at. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's all local. We're hoping to introduce a lot more in the way of like useful cloud features. So right now, the printer config list, the printer profiles are hosted online, and we can update those without updating the app. So I can always just change those, and then they get pulled down every time you ask for printers. 
we're looking to make it so your printers and configs are synced. It's not quite ready for release today, but we have that almost done. Ooh, I'm and looking then, forward to that. Yeah, yeah, because it's an annoying thing when, I mean, I use Simplify 3D, so you have to go download all your profiles again and stuff. And then um, you, we're looking to actually have a publishing process. And my personal favorite is a little bit more sharing of projects and the project workflow has a lot of really interesting stuff that we're looking to do with it. Um, a lot, if you think of, uh, if you've ever used Onshape, the way that they have very easily shareable uh, workspaces and mm. things like that, as well as some other really cool stuff uh, I could talk about if you're interested. But yeah, that, that kind of useful cloud features, um, hopefully without any of the, the drawbacks. I know for a while we had the documentation in app and it was, so you, you didn't have to be online to be able to use it. We'll get that back in. It was just nice. easier to just point to people online. So when you say shareable projects, are you thinking like um, I could do a build plate of parts with all my supports and everything the way I want them, and I could share that over to Aaron and let him print that on his printer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, right now we have the way, right now if you want to share your full prints out, you've got to take like four different files and send them over, which you guys have absolutely dealt with. And uh, it's not the smoothest workflow. Um, it's on its way, be, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're creating, I've just finished creating basically like a factory file kind of thing like Simplify. Mm -hmm. It'll be, you know, a single zip file renamed, basically, that you can export. It's actually an interesting workflow question, though, because... Uh, when you open up one of those files, what do you want out of it? Do you want the models? Do you want the printer profiles? Do you want the whole thing? In which case you might have printer profiles that you don't have in your local store. And so then it's like kind of a separate project from the rest of the workflow. It's going to take a little bit of finesse to make that process kind of work the way you want for different use cases. Yeah. But hopefully we can make each one of those pretty smooth. Uh, Very cool. Anyway, so that, that's without the cloud. and then. We'll have more of a, a publishing and sharing kind of way. Excuse me, doing things hopefully soon. Is that kind of why uh, Pathio exports all of the uh, machine configuration stuff in the actual G code file, or is that um, just for testing purposes? Mostly for testing purposes. I mean, that's what it, at least Simplify does. I don't know if Kira does that. I think it does also. Kira has the ability to output a header. Um, yeah, um, I, think, I think Slicer. I say Slicer. I'm going to always say <laughs> Slicer. I think Slicer does it too. Yeah. I, one of the little known features actually I simplify since I know a lot of the tips and tricks is pretty cool is that you can, um, when you say import printer profile, it actually, you know, have, it'll filter to usable uh, file types. It'll actually let you take G code files because if you select a G code file, it'll import a printer profile based off of that, what you use to slice which is really cool and really nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I don't actually use it very much, but it is really nice to be like, shoot, I don't remember what settings I used for that slice. You could just import it. So Boy. hopefully uh, we should be able to do that. That does sound cool. I needed that five hours ago. Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for being late. <laughs> yeah, there's so many tips and tricks in Simplify that I happen to know. Did you say you wrote the documentation on Simplify? I wrote some of it. Um, the visual troubleshooting guide was my project while I was there. Oh, nice. So good yeah, job. Most on that. of those photos and stuff. Yeah, I, I was hoping that it would be uh, useful. And then it has been more useful than I had hoped. So which is really great. When I supported uh, all the printers that I was supporting at the big yellow tractor job, often people would call me and be like, this printer is crap. I've got this and this and this going on and i'm like here's this thing <laughs> and then i would send them that guide and they'd be like if it's any of those problems it's probably not your printer's fault it's probably yeah. yours so let's work together to fix it and that was very useful so thank you <laughs> i was actually in the process of writing one for cat when that came out and then i was just like oh i don't have to do that now i have a link <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny I'm hoping once we get the launch done to do a little bit more of that. Basically, I was thinking over the summer, now that I have a little bit more free reign because I'm not just an intern, how would I make that better? Because also we want to have, of course, our own resource as good as the Simplify one is not for Pathio. Right. And um, what I'm hoping to do shortly once we have a little bit more dev time is to create 
basically an integrated one of those. As I said, because of the UI, we have a lot of flexibility with how slicing settings are displayed. So I'm hoping to create some curated slicing pages, basically. So you do the same thing as the, the visual troubleshooting guide. You have a bunch of problems that manifest in different ways. You say, I've got that problem. And it says, okay, here are the four slicing settings you're going to have to change. Um, hopefully also walks you through the process of changing them. So a little bit on the self-help side, a little bit on the creating a wizard to uh, tune and things like that. I'm really excited about the possibilities of doing that because I think that people I've been hanging out on 3D printing fretted and their discord channels and things like that. And the same problems come up so frequently. And yeah, it would be really nice to make it so that people don't have to reach out to the community for help if they can find what they need and get kind of the support uh, in a nice tailored way. I mean, that would be excellent. Uh, let's see if I can actually do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that we need to really make this kind of like evenly accessible across the the community. I mean, that part of the problem is that so much of that good information is on Discord, which is not Google searchable. Uh, it's on Facebook, which is not Google searchable. Yeah, it's in places that are very ephemeral. Yes. Um, and not curated. And that's why I'm glad that you guys went with a discourse form instead of a Facebook group. And yes. So, so happy with that. So many of the good Facebook groups are dying and moving over to discourse. And there's so many people that are mad about it. And I don't care because it's <laughs> so much better. Discourse is such a good platform. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too smart for its own good. I keep trying to add like fake content so I can take screen caps of it. And it always yells at me. It's like, ah, that's not a useful post. You need, you know, this many characters because <laughs> you're not really adding to the discussion. I'm like, God damn it. Of course, I run this place. I don't care what it says. Like, let me do what I want. Um, it says founder yeah. after my name. Damn it. I can say <laughs> that if I want. Yeah. Um, and like when I tried to create a new person to see what the site is like it always has these extremely helpful pop-ups that are like oh you should check out this part of the site you should i'm like i'm just trying to take screenshots guys like yeah stop <laughs> yeah and they um, don't have a way to skip it like slack does slack's yeah. like you've already been here you're fine discourse is like no you're watching it again <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i really like the the platform but it's just been really funny getting set up with it because I've never used it before. And it's just, let me let me show you how to do things. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the tech stack. Oh, sure. Go um, talk about that. I'm a big fan of the, the tech stack you guys chose. It's a React app inside Electron, right? Yes, indeed. And you have some sort of local backend that's then abstracted away from the front end. So then you have your C++ backend. I yes. think it's a very smart way to do it for a modern 3D printing app. You now have the ability to utilize the strengths of both um, fields, quote unquote, of yep. development, where yep. you have the, the web front end, where you have all these you know frameworks, and all these libraries for making very visually appealing interfaces. But then you also get the quickness and the uh, functionality of a fast, low-level C++ backend. Yeah, I mean, we we are very happy to use 100% of your CPU at any given time as long <laughs> when you're slicing. Yes, we will munch that up. I know. I know. Uh, Electron apps are very uh, tongue in cheek lately with how much RAM they can take up, but I think all apps in the future are going either web based, and you know, it's just a really simple tool to be able to take your web based app and wrap it up in Electron. So now it's a local app. Yeah, it sucks for right now, but it, it'll only get better down the road. Yeah, so. it's pretty cool because it's let us like, for example, I, you guys may have seen it or may not because we took it out recently, but we had a really nice plugin called User Snap, which would let you kind of automatically send us tickets and things like that. Uh, it lets you draw on the screen and, and, you know, share information. We took it out because nobody was really using it and we have a slightly better way of doing it now. Um, but we were able to use that because it's, you know, it's for web apps and then did a little bit of dev work on it, just hooked in. Uh, and we're quite happy with that. Similarly, like uh, I'm going to start using Zendesk for uh, triaging people's problems. And we should we if we decide we want to, we might put an actual little chat window in there, just like a lot of the websites have that are, you know, you look like you're trying to buy, you know, new sneakers. Would you like to talk to someone about it? And I'm always <laughs> like, not not really, but thanks. 
please leave it's me nice alone. to know you guys care um hopefully it would be a little bit more useful uh in a slicer than on the store <laughs> right so i saw you guys have a elastic search in there somewhere yeah. what were you planning on doing with that so i've never used elastic search before um right now we're using that and cabana um and that is our logging infrastructure at the moment and during beta it's I guess kind of the price of admission, I guess, to the beta is that you agree to give us your anonymized logs and things like that. We just, right before launch, did a lot of restructuring to make sure that we don't take anything that is, you know, we shouldn't have uh, or that it's intrusive. So we used to log file paths and things like that. And we were like, huh, maybe we shouldn't do that Um, (laughs) because that's a little creepy. So we are not going to be doing that anymore, except in the case of crashes, hopefully we'll get that hooked out of the crash infrastructure because we're using backtrace for that. Um, so yeah, so we're using that mostly for logging, which is a really interesting, if you've, if you've never used Elasticsearch, it's, I mean, I'm always mind boggled how fast it is. Just I'm dealing with tens and hundreds of thousands of logs of mostly stuff that I don't want to see. And I'm looking for basically the one that I do want to see. And the speed at which I can do that without any coding um, on Kibana is super cool and then i can create dashboards of like well we have this many people slicing today and this many errors and here are the top errors now let's go fix those errors um i could do that all without touching the actual elastic search back end uh, that's really super cool. cool so yeah if you've never tried out cabana go check out what it does because it's really cool huh. um, and really cheap too it's uh, apparently uh, as expensive to get elastic search co to host your cabana instance as it is to just run it on like AWS yourself. So there's no reason not to use them, which is really awesome. I'm really glad you, you glad that you guys chose to do some uh, self-reporting on the app itself because, you know, getting users to submit feedback and stuff, it's always a pain. But if yes. you can just have the app itself, you know, send all those logs and the analytics stuff automatically, then you'll get so much more feedback to be able to make decisions off of. Yeah, I'm hoping that it's more useful for us right now. We kind of have a weird setup because when you we have a little happy face and smart and sad face in the corner. So when you click one of those, it asks you if you want to send your config and your model. You know if we can if we can borrow them to recreate your problem. Right now, those go into Elasticsearch, which is kind of a weird place for them. They should really go to really they should go to a database so that we can auto run benchmarking against those models and see how many we fixed over time, which would be really cool. We can have a graph of this many errors and going down to zero because we will we will get them all we currently are still working on kind of that full reporting process hopefully it'll be a little bit more like integrating user snap um, again i was inspired by how on shape does things because they're i guess kind of very close to what we do because they have a web front end mm-hmm. um, so they use user snap you can draw on your app and then you share your project with on shape support if you have a problem so they can get back to you. And then I assume that opens some kind of ticket, maybe with Zendesk, if they use that. Um, same kind of thing. Was we're hoping to get your feedback, know that we need to reply to it and say, ah, yes, this is X issue. We've seen it before. We'll put you on the list of people to be notified when we fix it. That's the dream right now. We're still deciding if that's the right thing to do or not, because this is all new to me. <laughs> I'm used to 3D printing Dota models, so... What do I know? <laughs> I was going to say that one of my uh, my other favorite features of Pathio is um, the scripting engine, mm, um, and being, I, having yes. like being at the print end of the print. You have retraction, unretraction, Z hop. I think there's even an unZ hop. Like all these different stages of the printing process, you can actually add custom G code, and it'll insert it. You know when it's actually rendered. Yeah, it's amazing to me that other slicers haven't done as good of a job with scripting as they probably could have. So for example, um, when we were writing the, the scripting bit, because I know uh, Joe in particular, this was a problem for you with the, the lull spot is that you had, you know, you're starting scripting. You're like, I want to be able to do these things. And you're like, shoot, we don't, we don't let them do that yet. Let's, you know, let's fix that. And we put in uh, another really great library because we're using the JavaScript front end. Uh, I think it's called Inja. It's a really nice text editing. And that let us, um, me even actually, this was something I did on a weekend because I was curious if I could um, added syntax highlighting and, and autocomplete. Basically, made the scripting process just that much simpler and, and nicer to use. And we're looking to add more triggers and just 
last week added every single slicing setting that we've got into there. Nice. Most of which are kind of useless. Like, I don't know why you would want to put if you have a raft turned on, like into your start G code, but you do you. Um, <laughs> I just thought there's no reason not to do this. And the cost is, I mean, for the devs, it was zero. I just went through and copy and pasted a bunch of text. So I don't really understand why other slicers have not great uh, scripting workflows, but we're hoping to basically let people to do whatever they want. In particular, we were kind of kicked in the butt because E3D is launching the tool changer and we would really like to be able to fully support the tool changer and all of its awesomeness, which means you need a lot of a lot flexibility because you don't know what people yeah. are going to be doing with it. Yeah, I haven't started using Pathio with my tool changer yet. Yeah, one experimental thing is is enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm having enough trouble slamming my head into my bed for strange reasons on my own with slicers i know really well so <laughs> it does seem on i'm on the that slack channel as well it's there's an interesting mix of really incredible results and lots and lots and lots of hardware questions and issues <laughs> yeah ah yeah uh uh, a little ways back you said there was logging and stuff was the price of admission to the beta is Pathio open source? Is it what's is it not? Is it going to be a charge slicer? Now, how long have we been talking? It took us so long to get to the question. Yeah. The question. <laughs> the and question. we've been joking in the office, like no matter what we do, whenever the first thing we talk to someone from the outside, the very first question is, is Pathio open source? I was talking to to two the answer is no, by the way. Let me not keep you in uh, suspense. I was talking to two not magazines, two web, you know, 3D printing web places. Both of them, very first question was, is Pathio open source? And I was like, no, no, it's not. Um, so the reasoning behind that, basically, the way we like to describe that is, if you look at the open source projects in the 3D printing world, or in the slicing world, we've got Kira, we've got Prusa's Slicer, which I will not name because I'll get laughed at again. <laughs> <laughs> we've got Lulzbot's Fork of Kira. We've got the main uh, uh, Slicer. Uh, slicer or and uh, and some other closed source ones. So either you've got the closed source ones, which are obviously either paid, but anything that's free or and or open source are all backed by a printer manufacturer. Basically say, hey, look, you can buy our printer and here's a great selling point. We have a really great slicer that we make and it's really good. And for some of them, the Ultimaker or, or Prusa's, they're also open source, which is just another even better selling point. We, Pathio is a separate company from E3D, so we don't have any other revenue source other than the app itself. So we don't have any other way of making money, so we can't give it away for free. Um, I've been trying to see if we can make chunks at least open source, um, and certainly we're looking to make contributions to the open source libraries that we use. I mean, I've been saying all this time, there's, oh, there's this part and, you know, this project and that project that we're, that we're using. I'm at least personally committed to tr like trying to make sure that we can give back a little bit in those ways. The general consensus is there's not really a way that we can open source without also making money. So you can, it's just really hard. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have to, I mean, most of them are like, like Elasticsearch, right? Where you, you can have our software, but if you want to run it, you really should run it on our servers. But obviously, we're not doing that. You run it locally. Um, the next logical question is, okay, so if you're not open source uh, and you said you don't have any revenue, is this going to cost me money? So which the answer is maybe. We don't really know. Um, at some point after open beta, which will be several months down the line, maybe around six, but I don't want to give a hard answer because we don't know exactly what it's going to be. Basically, after that, we're going to charge some people some amount of money is the way we're saying it. <laughs> um, it's very vague. It, it might be a low kind of subscription cost for everybody. It's kind of like a netflix -y kind of model, very cheap with no upfront cost. It might be more of an Autodesk model where we give it away for free for students and uh, non-commercial users and then make big car companies that will undoubtedly want to use it pay lots and lots and lots of money. We don't know exactly what is going to be viable for us so that we can keep making a slicer. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I'm personally trying to push as hard as I can for at least letting you know students use it for free, because if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been able to do half of the 3D printing that I had done. Yeah, I think a lot of us are like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a question of can we sustain 
kind of an Autodesk model, because I feel like Autodesk has it really right with the, ah, if you're not making money, we shouldn't charge you because you won't use our software otherwise. And or you'll just pirate it, let's be honest. So you might as well have it for free. And then if you get a job and you use it for your job, well, then the job pays for it and nobody cares because it's not not like real money at that point, right? It's, It's the business's money. But that requires that you have huge numbers of people wanting to use your software in a corporate setting, basically, because that's how they make their money. Yep. So if we don't have that, then that may not be viable. Um, We got to keep making the slicer because otherwise, you know, what's the point? (laughs) Yeah. Everyone's got to eat. So and that's the thing, though, like there's the simplified controversy that's going on right now that they want to charge for an upgrade. And yeah. even though it's in the terms of services, everyone's losing their mind. So I, I think it is important for you guys to be up front you know, from the very beginning that it is going yeah, to we, be. We don't want it to be a surprise for yeah, sure. A, a paid piece of software and it's not going to be open source. And, you know, there's reasons for that. And it's because yeah. Gabe and his team need to pay rent and eat food and make you wonderful, wonderful slicing software. Yeah. I mean, if people have suggestions of how we can make it almost unobtrusive in a way that can still support development or definitely all years, I've been looking under every rock to find a way (laughs) that we could open source this because I would, I mean, it just makes me feel a lot better if we could do that as much as possible. Right. Um, So far, I haven't found anything that works for our particular app, but, uh, on a discourse, hit us up. Always happy to hear new ideas, and maybe we can come up with something that works for everybody, so that the, you know the most good comes out of a slicer. And just one of the things that's always personally inspired me is the the way that the rep rep project can conducts itself. Is that from the very beginning they always said, "Ah, yes, you know, the best way to add the most utility to the world is that we add the most printers to the world." Um, yeah. And so we're gonna share stuff and make it easy and. I will not compare Pathio to that because we're, you know, we don't, unfortunately, are not open source and don't deserve to be kind of put in that same sentence almost. It's it's not the same thing. Um, it's a company product. But I would like to hope that we add value to the world by existing, right? So Right. Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a really good interview. Thank you guys for having me on, for sure. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add to, to the end of this? I think we hit most of my things. I mean, if you before when I was listing my roles, uh, I, one of them that is not one of my roles is I'm not a marketing person. I do my best to kind of put forward the company line and not hype things more than it needs to be. Right. Um, because also that means more people coming to the support forum saying, you said it could do X and it can't do X yet. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't always necessarily do that just yet. Yeah. Um, So I think I've hit the things that I'm most excited about for the release. I guess the big thing that I would like to say is that, um, you know, we're we're releasing the app, but we are definitely still in beta. And you'll see that the very first time you try and slice something, especially if the thing you're trying to slice happens to be a broken mesh. Patheo still has a lot of problem with things that came out of Blender and aren't necessarily solid models. You know, be excited that we are doing this project. Um, Temper your expectations a little bit if you download Fathio that you may not find it um, 100% as well featured as other slicers that have got three-ish more years of development or four or five more than we do. We are going really fast. Um, We've built a slicer from scratch in 18 months, but we still need some more time to finish catching up. Basically, trying to figure out the best ways to catch up is why we're going to open beta right now is to get the most feedback. And you guys, like, literally in the business review that we had right before launch, deciding, you know, go or no go, do we delay another week? We were looking at the the roadmap, and after a few weeks, it basically says a big question mark, which is what we're hoping to get from everyone else is what are the most important things that you don't have right now, and where can we add value? Okay. So... That's kind of where we're at is we're at a beta stage. Um, We're not charging you. Don't think of it as a finished product because we're not there yet. Okay. So if people are excited still after you said all of that (laughs) and want to download Pathio, where do they get it? You can get it at pathio.xyz. I got them to let me say Z instead of Z. It was very exciting. Um, (laughs) xyz meaning uh 3d in 3d space we were trying to get path.io but unfortunately some guy owns that 
And then when we contacted him, put a weird poem up instead of selling it to us. So, anyway, <laughs> if that if that person happens to live uh, be listening, we would love to buy your domain. But um, yes, Pathio.xyz. You can find the documentation at docs.pathio.xyz. And the community is community.pathio.xyz. They're pretty easy to remember. Awesome. Um, well, that's all I've got. You got anything, Aaron? Nope. We touched everything that I want to touch on. Awesome. Glad we touched well, thank all you guys things, so Aaron. much for inviting me on. Um, I've been listening to the podcast when I go get my groceries, so it's kind of surreal actually being on, uh, but really lovely. <laughs> Good. Are we glad to count you in with the 34 other people. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exclusive club right now it is it, it definitely no, there, is we have way more people than the 34 and that is awesome thank you so much for coming on gabe this has been a really fun podcast keep making stuff guys for sure yep this is the end of the podcast Best. 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 Best.